Kaya. So if you'd just like to introduce yourself to the students, um, give you job title and a bit about the role that you do at the moment. So my name's Bev Harwood. I'm the clinical nurse specialist for emergency surgical admissions at Kings Mill Hospital. Um, so this was a, a new post when I joined um, back in July 2019. So see that so nobody had ever done the role before. So it was quite a challenge, um, sort of trying to understand um, obviously what the consultants wanted from me, what the service needs were for patients that were coming in um, under the emergency surgery team. So the emergency surgery admissions are people, it tends to be people that present with abdominal pain, such as appendicitis, um, gallstones, so obviously cholecystitis, abscesses, um, and anyone that's probably had surgery and then developed a complication from that surgery. Okay. Um, yeah, and also the, the, new, the challenge was for me as well. So I was actually new to Kings Mill Hospital and Sherwood Forest Hospital's NHS Trust, um, which I will say is an absolutely lovely place to work. And I'm glad I had the opportunity to come and work here. Can you give me a bit more information about Kings Mill Hospital and that kind of organisation? So, so the history of Kings Mill, as far as I've been made to believe is so it was originally going back to the second world war it was actually um, an american military hospital um, and actually if you come into the main entrance um they've got sort of a display cabinet with an old uniform in and there's quite a lot of history um sort of you know sort of memorabilia that people can look at which is quite interesting for if you're coming to visit the hospital um, so king's mill hospital is part of sherwood forest hospitals nhs trust so within that trust, we have Kings Mill Hospital, which is like the acute general hospital, which has the emergency department. We also have Newark Hospital, which is more of a rehab hospital and sort of an elective hospital. They will do sort of day case and planned operations. Um, and we also have Mansfield Community Hospital, which again is a rehab hospital. Obviously, we employ over a thousand people and obviously within those hospitals there's a variety of different roles which people are employed in um, again with king's mill itself i'm sure the um, students have heard of the care quality commission which is the cqc which go around inspecting hospitals gp practices um nursing homes and i'm proud to say that i work in an organization that was voted outstanding Wow. which is quite emotional really so um yeah so it's been an achievement for them because i believe sort of back in so i think it was 2016 um and again i don't know if the students remember or they they learn about the francis report which was where there was a sort of the incident at a hospital in stafford and from that we sort of the um, lord francis um, did a report and all these reforms were brought in to improve things and then also on top of that they had the keo report which looked at um sort of sort of large hospital death rates and unfortunately king's mill came into that category um and were unfortunately back at that time even though the staff worked really hard were, were voted as of re requiring improvement so in actually a four-year period to go from requiring improvement to outstanding which is the highest you can be rated by the CQC. So that's absolutely amazing for them. Wow. Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> and it is, as somebody that's worked here and that worked at a big teaching hospital before they came here, um, it is, it, you know, the staff do work really well together. Teamwork is really evident in this trust. So what other roles are there within the hospital? I guess there are loads and loads, but what are the general kind of things that people tend to so do? So we can have, so obviously we have nurses, as everyone expects, you have obviously healthcare assistants, which do a lot of nursing type roles. So they will do blood pressures, um, obviously help with washes. They will do some of the admission paperwork. Um, and again, that, that some of them actually do dressing, some go on to do further training so they can take bloods put the um, cannulas in so you know if somebody has a drip so that's the little needle that obviously people can be trained to put in obviously we have the porters we have the domestics we have the ward hostesses who go and give the patient meals out and um, obviously you've got people we've got shops within the hospital so you have people that are employed in those shops and um, you've got people radiographers who take x-rays um, 
you've got a physiotherapist, you've got physiotherapy assistants, you've got occupational therapy, occupational therapy assistants. We've also got people who were nurses who are actually employed on the educational side. So they're involved a lot with our training. Um, you've got medical secretaries, um, you've got waiting list coordinators. So they look at um, sort of obviously when people are listed for an operation, they ensure that the correct patients are put onto obviously the correct operating lists. Um, the list is absolutely endless. I could go on forever. We have people that work in the laboratories. Um, so obviously you have doctors, obviously. Um, so obviously what can happen here, so some people can be sort of a medical person working within the laboratory, i.e. a qualified doctor, but actually you can have assistants that work in the laboratory. So everybody's all different grades, but we all work together. I'm just trying to see if I forgot. So at the moment, obviously because of COVID, which is a very topical thing, yeah. we have quite a lot of staff um, that are employed to be our, what we call swab team. Okay. So anybody that comes into the hospital or that is admitted into the hospital is actually given a COVID swab. So I know that obviously this is quite a topical thing and, and people you know, probably want to know what happens. Um, so obviously, we don't know anybody's status until we get that swab result back, but hopefully we do get it back sort of within six hours. And that just defines really a, a sort of management, but safety from the nursing point of view as to obviously to ensure that we're wearing the correct equipment when we see to these patients. Right, okay. So what does a typical day look like for you? Let's so go. So my day, <laughs> <laughs> my day. So obviously, as I as I've said, you know, this was quite a new role. So it was sort of kind of establishing, obviously, what what quality, you know, what skills I already had to bring to this post, um, and then you know, where where do we go from here? How do we expand on that? So currently, um, my a normal day for me is I sort of get into my office about quarter to eight, um, literally just sort of gather all my belongings and ward round for the. Um, anyone that was admitted overnight starts at eight o'clock. So on that ward round will be myself, obviously the consultant um, and, and sort of different grades of doctors. So we usually start on ward 11, which is the surgical admissions ward. Um, and then literally it's just sort of a hand, you know, to a handover for the consultant because he may not have met these patients. It may have been a senior doctor that saw them overnight. Obviously just to check blood results, see what the next sort of stage of their care is, do we need to request any investigations for them? Obviously, I, I've done some extra training, so I can request things such as ultrasound scans, CT scans, and the MRI scans. Um, and also, do we need to request extra blood tests? Um, sometimes we have to, obviously, we've looked at somebody, what somebody's presented with, we've looked at the information we've got from scans, from their bloods. We may need to send those patients to theatre. So again, I will sort of make phone calls, liaise with theatre to check these patients are on the operating list. And I will then contact the anaesthetist um, because obviously people need, if we're going to give you an anaesthetic, we need to just assess your health and that you're fit enough for this anaesthetic. Um, the other, other, going back to COVID, so obviously the thing we need to chase up for any patient that we think is on the theatre list, obviously because of staff safety, we then you know need to ensure whether they're a negative or positive. Um, so what, if a patient isn't consented for theatre, again, I've done extra training, so I will go and talk to these patients about their operation, um, what it's going to involve, and obviously, you know, give them information leaflets about it, and then answer any questions they might have about that operation. Um, I've spent, you know, a lot of my career was spent as a theatre nurse, so obviously I've got a lot of knowledge there about the operations that they're going to have. Um, and then obviously just talk to them a little bit about their aftercare after their operation. So that's most of, sort of takes up most of my morning. Um, then I have sort of a, a, about an hour of office time where I will keep spreadsheets of any sort of any admission that we've had, anybody a readmission, obviously to look at what our numbers are really um, and, and what can we do to make it better. Um, I have just started, or I will be starting as of next week, my own clinic so between 12 and one o'clock in the day I will see up to four patients and they will be so some of our patients go home with drains in whether they've had their a planned operation or an emergency one and sometimes the consultants you know just want them to come back for a review and so you have to think 
does a consultant actually need to do that or is that something I can do which it is and um, we'll look at does this dream, drain need to stay in or actually can it come out today some people might have wound complications um, after surgery so again I'll just assess that wound and um, see how they're doing um, and then feedback to the consultants some of our patients um, sort of around April and May time when it was obviously the first wave of COVID we, we had to sort of manage people differently so somebody with gallstones so that's where you get stones in your gallbladder we couldn't always it wasn't safe to do surgery at that time and sometimes people aren't fit enough for the surgery so sometimes they have a special drain put in so what so a lot of these patients do tend to come back to me and I'll teach them how to flush these drains if they've got any complications with them. Um, and, and then another part of my day is obviously to, um, to telephone sort of conversations with patients just to, to see how they're doing. And again, and it's just sort of like looking at really, um, you know, what we can do to make the service better, you know, how I can make improvements for the service. Yeah. And so I, ha I have done some teaching sessions as well with the ward staff. So if we've had sort of a, a problem area where somebody's not really known how to care for a certain patient. I've been asked to do a teaching session about, about that certain sort of illness with somebody. So, and, and that, you know, and that's a part, an aspect of my role that I enjoy doing as well, so. so. Did you train to teach people or has that element of your job just come with your experience? So I did, so as a nurse, you can actually do, once you've done your basic training and you're qualified, you, you can actually, you are encouraged to sort of do this mentor training. So although I haven't done an official teaching training, I've sort of done mentorship, but obviously over the years, um, and I've worked in lots of different places, um, but obviously I've, I've, I've sort of learned a lot about different conditions and it's something that I'm really interested in, especially on the surgical side, you know, about the sort of the appendicitis, the gallbladders, pancreatitis, and how these patients present and actually you know looking at the best practices to look after these people so we get the best outcomes for them so that leads quite nicely what path did you actually take to get to where you are now so, going well, well did i <laughs> so, <laughs> so do you want me to go back to when i was at school I'll so for this yeah <laughs> right so so when i was at school <laughs> things were slightly different um, so I sort of within my O levels, I did um, biology, chemistry, and physics, and obviously maths, English, geography. But that's because I enjoyed the sciences. Mm. And even though when I was at school, I still wasn't quite sure which way I wanted to go. I think by the time I was in my final year, I was quite looking into food technology. Strangely, <laughs> um, and then I went to sixth form college where I was doing chemistry, biology. And I think I did physics and I was, but I was doing home economics more from that food technology point of view. Um, and again, as I say, things are quite different. So I left sixth form college after a year and then went to technical college um, just because I thought that the subjects they were offering me were more the kind of thing I wanted to do. And it was while I was at technical college, um, I started doing a pre-nursing course. And so that actually took me out to um, a hospital up north, is Wrightington Hospital. Um, one or two days a week um, to an orthopaedic hospital and actually I'd, from that moment I thought I'm really enjoying this and that was just getting to know you know I was just chatting to the patients they'd take me when they were doing dressings um, and then sort of so I actually never did any A-levels because when I started nursing I sort of decided after that year when I was 18 that I actually know I want to I do want to be a nurse now um, Things were very different then because it wasn't a degree profession at the time. So what you did was you actually applied to the hospital, to the School of Nursing, which was actually based at the hospital. Um, and then obviously I was lucky enough to get on my nurse training in Warrington Hospital um, in 1987. And then from then I've never looked back, to be honest. So, as I said, very different, not a degree profession, but it was a very hands-on training um, at that time. So you would sort of initially spend six weeks within the school and then you'd go out and do ward placements for four months at a time. Then you'd go back into school for two weeks consolidation and then you'd have like a week or two's holiday and then it would all start again. So you'd have your learning, do your physic, your practical element of it and then back for your consolidation. 
so over three and a half years that 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 took us through med medical wards surgical wards the speciality wards such as orthopedics gynecology uh we spent two months doing psychiatry two months within theatres uh we had a placement of four months of community where we went sort of did occupational health type things spent time with district nurses practice nurses and uh, the ambulance service we didn't do the fire service and the police and but that so that was actually quite interesting um and then so back in those days we, we sort of did what we called the state finals so again it wasn't this continuing sort of assessment it was literally you had your three and a half years at the end of it was a day of exams basically um so you said you had 15 short answer questions then you had um three sort of essays that you had to write on how would you base this patient's care in a needs-based approach things like that and then we, we we did have to do like a research critique so obviously as I know from the students of today that's very different to what they did yeah. but I yeah. feel that our training back then was very much more a sort of medical training because we had to know about conditions and we had to know about treatment um so from then so once I qualified I decided that I wanted to go and work in the operating department because I thought the operating department and surgery was extremely interesting um, and so I went to work in London I'd qualified in a hospital up north and I went to work at a great big teaching hospital in London which was a bit of a culture shock to start with because this I had come from a hospital that was relatively new to go and work to this one that was like so old and I was like oh my no oh no what have I gone to and um, and that was interesting but I think because my family up north I sort of you know when I was young and I missed them so I wanted to, so I moved back up north to Manchester then still within theatres um during that time within nursing as well we used to have these courses that were called English national board courses and so if you wanted to work in a specialized area like theatres the emergency department intensive care um that they used to encourage you to do these courses, which are about six months or 12 months to get this sort of extra certificate. And that would help you go get promotion. Um, so obviously, so in those days we had, so a newly qualified staff nurse would be a D grade. And then if you'd done these extra qualifications, you were then classed as sort of a senior staff nurse and you were being given an E grade. That all changed a few years ago. And we're now banded in numbers. So there's no really any differentiation now between senior and junior staff nurse. Um, so for, for the first 23 years of my career, I, I was mainly a theatre nurse. So that meant obviously I was trained to sort of hand instruments for different operations to surgeons. Um, but it's obviously the main focus of it is the patient safety, making sure that you've got all the equipment that you need. Is that patient safe on the table? Um, obviously ensuring that you're supporting your staff as well as them supporting you and obviously you're supporting the anaesthetist and um, the surgeon. Um, sometimes I'd work in the recovery department so that was looking after the patients after they'd had their operation and before you send them back to the ward and um, just ensuring that obviously you know they are coming around after their anaesthetic. Throughout that 23 years I Although I enjoyed theatres, I did miss sort of ward-based nursing. So sort of now and again, I would do an extra shift on my days off on the wards just to sort of keep my skills updated. Yeah. Um, during that first 23 years as well, um, I worked as a nurse first assistant. So again, that was extra training for me. So I was then able to assist at an operation um, for ladies that were having either cesarean sections, obviously, so they can't, somebody can't have a baby normally, and we do, with, they cut them, um, or any gynecological operations, and I was trained to, like, um, sew up the skin wounds afterwards, which was quite nerve-wracking when you do your first one, but apparently I did a very neat job, so. <laughs> so that was, that takes me up to 2001, so, but, oh, between 97 and 2001, I went to work in the Channel Islands in Jersey. So I'm sure some of the students have probably heard of Jersey and the Channel Islands. So that was a bit like a four year sort of holiday for me, really. Um, I never sort of, I think at some points I thought, oh, I want to go and work in Saudi Arabia. I want to go and work in America. But actually for me, going to work in Jersey was far enough because it was near to get back from my family. Um, and then, so then obviously I came back to the NHS in 2001, um, obviously worked as the nurse first assistant, and then I just worked in a hospital near my family for a while. Um, and then I came to Nottingham in 2004. 
um, initially working at Queen's Medical Centre within their operating department. And then I say, when, when I got to sort of two, 23 years as a theatre nurse, I thought I really need to, you know, do something different now. So within nursing, that just shows you can make a change. You know, you don't have to stay in one speciality all the time. If you sort of get an insight into another area and think, oh, that's what I really want to do, then you can do it. The, the opportunities are there. Um, so I went to work on a surgical assessment ward, which obviously is obviously quite similar to the job I do now, but obviously I was a ward nurse at that time. So that was obviously looking at the patients that get admitted um, before they're transferred to a longer stay ward. Um, from there, I then got promotion to sort of a specialist nurse. So specialist nurses can be paid equivalent to either a deputy ward manager or a sort of ward leader. So we're sort of band sixes or band sevens as specialist nurses. So that was within gynecology and that was looking after ladies in the early pregnancy unit. Um, and so obviously offering a lot of support for them at, and sort of emergency gynecology admissions. Um, I'd, that was a role to cover maternity leave. So as that the cover was due to end, I then um, got a job as a colorectal nurse practitioner, which was an absolutely job that I absolutely adored. So for four years, I during that four years, I was trained to do my own nurse led clinics. Um, the patients that we saw were, so patients of a certain age that present with certain things and the GPs refer them to the hospital on what we call a two week wait pathway because what we want to do is exclude bowel cancer in those patients. So the service that the colorectal nurse practitioners offered was literally rather than actually somebody wait to come to a hospital appointment, um, they would, the GPs would refer into the colorectal nurse practitioner team and we would see from those patients who could we do a telephone assessment on um, and book them directly for an investigation or actually who do we need to see in clinic or who actually needs to see a consultant. Mm -hmm. So that was actually quite a busy job. Um, the other aspect of my role at that time was obviously looking at people that came in for their bowel cancer operations and actually what can we do to make their stay better because hospitals aren't safe places to be in. We're better to sort of get you up and moving and get you home to recover. Mm -hmm. um, and during my time doing that job, we actually increased our admission rates by 50% on the wards of people going home sort of in an idealistic time frame. Um, but then after four years, I because it was the same speciality all the time, I just thought I need to do something different. And yeah. I'd worked in the same organisation for 15 years at that point. And I just thought I need to do, I need, and I, I feel like the need for a change. And actually this post that I'm in now um, was advertised, I think, in March last year. And because actually it was every aspect of general surgery. So we've got colorectal, which is bowel, hepatobiliary, which is obviously liver, gallbladder, upper GI, which we class as the stomach and the esophagus. Um, again, it's like the, the abscesses, the hernias, that type of thing. And the fact that, you know, for me, it was a way I could consolidate all this experience I'd gained over the last 30, 33 years um, and actually look to make a difference somewhere. And actually, strangely, the consultants that I worked for, I had actually worked with over the years when they were junior doctors. So it's quite nice. Yeah, so no, so um, as I keep saying to my consultant, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and work here. And every day is like a totally different day, so. So would you say that it's been easier or harder than you expected in terms of moving to different areas within nursing? So I think initially, so back in the 90s, which I know people are going to laugh at now, <laughs> Um, especially the students of today when, when they hear about how many like you know we've got this big shortage of nurses in the 90s it was quite a different story so up north it was actually quite difficult to get jobs up north at that time um which, which I know people just think oh no what happened so actually if you were lucky to have a job up north you literally sort of stayed in it and there wasn't much scope for movement um so I sort of I stayed up north, but I managed to get different jobs in different hospitals, uh, but it was still always theatre or recovery. And at that point, it, it was a bit. So at that one point, I had this interest in going to work in a renal unit for patients that have dialysis because the kidneys aren't working properly. Yeah. But actually, it, it was quite difficult. And actually, I remember somebody at an interview saying to me, well, we don't want you to lose your theatre skills. 
which actually when you but I think for me that was the only time that I was like sort of thinking but actually I don't want to do this anymore I want to go and do yeah. something else um obviously I found that it is it is a lot easier for movement because obviously yes there are those vacancies um and again we you sort of you know and if people don't want to work full-time now or you know you're a bit unsure you don't want to work in the same place we do have so here we have a nurse bank or we have so that's where people just do ad hoc shifts. I will tend to do an ad hoc shift on a Saturday night. Um, or people can jo join nursing agencies. But then again, you know, for me, I, I like the stability of working in the NHS. Yeah. Um, I know we shouldn't talk about pensions already, but actually, you know, if you, if you work for the NHS, you join the superannuation pension scheme which is something so a lot of nurses my age are able to retire at 55 that's not bad is it because they start, <laughs> yeah so so but because what happened was because we started working at the age of 18 and were paid by the school of nursing you actually started paying your, your pension at that age so that's why you, you sort of see some people saying oh I'm 55 I've retired but they've actually either gone back part-time or or what do what we call retire and return Right, okay. So in terms of pursuing a career in your kind of field, have you got any advice that you can give to the students? Any major tips? So I would say, so obviously, you know, if you get the opportunity, obviously I don't know what courses you do out there now, if you get the opportunity to sort of do insight visits, um, I'd be happy for someone to come and spend a day with me, you know, shadow me, follow me around. Um, is you know, if you get the opportunity, it isn't Holby City, <laughs> a little <laughs> casualty. Um, but if you get the opportunity to have an insight visit onto a ward, even a nursing home, I worked for, in a nursing home for a little bit, you're sort of doing the odd shift. Um, you know, get out of it. If you don't get the same, the, the grades first time round, don't worry because we do access courses. The other thing we have now is what we call a nursing associate roles. So these are, that's sort of a role between a healthcare assistant and a qualified nurse. So obviously it's a sort of a bit of a grey area for me because I don't know that much about them, but actually people will go off um, and their class is trainee nurse and associates. You can then be put on the nursing midwifery council register and actually a trainee or a nursing associate once you're qualified is a band four um, and they are actually able to do quite a lot of the nursing roles, including um, dispensing medications to patients. So there's that, one. and then obviously, you know, it doesn't necessarily you have to come into nursing as again, if you want to work in a hospital, there's loads of different roles within the hospital that you can do. Um, oh, the one thing I forgot to mention is, so within theatres, so you can be a nurse working in the operating department, or the other course that they offer is operating department practitioners. So operating department practitioners, again, is a totally different course, but these people are trained purely to work in an operating department. So they're trained to work on the anaesthetic side, um, the scrub side, as we call it. So that's when you were handling the instruments and the recovery side. But so, so you know, if you think, oh, yes, I want to work, you know, a hospital, please don't think you have to concentrate on the nurse. You know, I need to be a nurse because there's so many, there is such a variety of roles that you can do. Um, and as I say that, you know, if you haven't got those grades first time round, you know, consider the nursing access courses. Okay. And so, always think that within, obviously, you know, if, if nursing was something you choose, again, you don't have to stay in the same hospital that you've done most of your training is, you've got that opportunity to move all over the country or go and work abroad as well. Which is, which is really good. So for you, you'd say, get your foot in the door, have a look, shadow people, see what they're doing, then you'll get a better idea of what it yeah. is. Yeah. Because I know sometimes, you know, unfortunately with the media that the only see, about, you know, sometimes we paint a bad picture of things, but actually it is a very rewarding job. So this is me, I'm going to blow my own trumpet now. So I've been here 16 months. Yeah. Um, I've had a nomination for a Staff Excellence Award. So these are these awards that we have in, in regard to the care that you give. And apparently this is like the patients nominate you. And then um, yesterday I had a nomination for a DAISY Award. So that's just like little things of recognition that give you that feedback that actually, yo, so what I am doing is, is really good. Yeah, amazing. Well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so there are, like I say, there are, you know, you, you can go home, you can have a really bad day. And this happened to me, and you just think, 
well, tomorrow's a different day. And they do encourage you within nursing to do like reflective practice that what could I have done differently? Um, you know, and actually, I think it is important to do that. And so a lot of the times you think, actually, no, I couldn't have done anything differently. I, I did the absolute best that I could. And, and the, again, the reward is actually, you know, when a, when a patient says to you sometimes, actually, thank you so much for listening to me, you've made a difference to my day. Because I think as nurses as well, um, patients do think the nurses are more empathetic. And probably because we do have more of that time, you know, I see it myself, the doctors will rush past and have a quick sort of chat on ward and I find that I'll have to go back and I spend longer with them talking about things. Yeah. Is there anything that you'd have done differently over the course of your career? <coughs> it sounds that you've done... I don't, to be <laughs> honest, I don't know, it's funny, I was, I was asking myself this the other day and I actually think, no, I don't think there would have been. So, you know, yes, I was, there was that in my early 20s thinking, oh, should I have gone to work abroad? But actually, I'm glad I didn't, I, I, you know. So one of the things for me is that, you know, it wasn't a degree profession when I started. So for nurses like myself, we have got that opportunity um, to obviously do a degree anyway, to bring us up to that, you know, the degree level, even though actually sort of clinically, you know, we have got a great deal of experience, but unfortunately we just don't have that piece of paper. So we do have that opportunity to go and do degree modules. So um, I think I've got, mine's probably expired now though, knowing me, so, but obviously, so the next step for me is actually like looking at, okay, here I am now, where, where am I gonna go next? So actually one thing I'm looking at is, um, so in some roles they like, which, it, you know, you can, nurses can prescribe. So I think that's one little step for me as students. So that's a degree module. Um, or you can go and do master's things in like service improvement and things like that. So, and even for anyone that thought actually, well, I'm not quite sure, I haven't quite got the grades now. Well, actually you can start off as a healthcare assistant. And then actually as time goes on, you're getting that insight into everything. And then actually you can then, you know, apply to do your nursing. Yeah, that sounds like a good tip. A really good tip. Are there any kind of materials that you've got that the students could maybe refer to or have a look at, whether that be websites, podcasts, books, courses, just anything? So I would obviously look at, um, you know, obviously which university courses are offered. Yeah. Um, look at the Nursing and Midwifery Council online because that is our governing body. Um, so they sort of set the standards that we have to work to, uh, which is prioritised. I always forget them. So it's like sort of, you know, they sort of say to us, we have to practice, you know, effectively, practice safely, prioritise people. Um, there is a fourth one, I know I always forget it. Obviously, sort of look on the websites about different hospitals and, and it sort of tells you a lot about that hospital. Um, you know, obviously, YouTube, obviously I'm old now, but so YouTube and things like that, just sort of, you know, look about, um, you know, someone might tell you about how to, how to do this sort of thing. How, you know, how, how do we, you know, how to do a certain dressing. Um, and I'm sure people have put podcasts on about, you know, how they're finding their training and I've made so it has been a difficult year for them um it's been a, quite a strange year for all of us to be honest so we've had to get you know obviously outside that you've had to like sort of you know teach differently obviously people are wearing masks wherever we go now obviously we've had to get used to wearing those within the hospital nearly all the time um but you know just sort of you know ignore what you read on social media I would just say, sort of, you know, go to like Nursing Midwifery Council is probably the best one um, because they will direct you to other areas and that will tell you a lot more about sort of, you know, what nursing does. Um, and I, like you look at the universities, think of an area that you'd quite like to go and study in um, and, you know, and sort of see what their course is. And if it's something you want to do, you know, you don't necessarily have to think, oh, well, actually, I like... I live in Mansfield or I live in Nottingham, therefore I'm just going to do my nurse training here. Actually, you could go and do your nurse training somewhere else. Yeah, the world is a bigger place than your own city. It is. And then the other thing, I mean, you know, as well, so one of the things I wanted to do um, when I was younger, I wanted to be a nurse in the army, but then, then I had to have back surgery. So obviously that just sort of changed the way I did things. Um, but no, so you just, you know, just don't think that that's it. I'm going to train in this hospital and I'm going to stay here and I'm going to stay on this ward for the rest of my life because you don't have to. Shop around. There's so much opportunity. 
And even some people actually start off doing their nurse training and then go off and do them become a doctor instead. Yeah. So there's there's lots of different options. So explore them in a nutshell. Yeah. So like I say, you don't have to be a nurse. There's plenty of other things that you can be within a hospital. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for all of that. You've given a lot of insightful information and I'm sure it's going to really help the students um, with their studying and their learning and development. Um, and I'm sure some of them will want to take you up on the shadowing. <laughs> That's fine, lady. Yeah, no. <laughs> Just drop me an email and I'll give you my contact numbers. That would be absolutely So I work Monday. Yeah, no, I work Monday to Friday, eight till four. So I'm always around. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much for speaking to me. I really do appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Nadine. Bye. Bye.